thank you guys so much for having me here tonight. Um, my name is Karen Sheely. I'm a staff attorney at the ACLU of Illinois. And I, what I want to talk about tonight is how we use data and we use um, encourage the government to open up data to uh, improve issues around criminal justice reform. So that's the focus, although we use data in a lot of other ways too. It's, it's how we keep track of our consent decrees with DCFS, with, with a lot of agencies. And, uh, and we also we use it in just basically every aspect of our work is, is very data focused. Um, so the ACLU of Illinois is the American Civil Liberties Union, for, for people who might not be familiar with it because we've got some out of counters. It's, um, it's an organization that focuses on enforcing all of our constitutional rights. We focus on the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment and really all of them. Um, but uh, the, the, the kind of the cases that we have that might be of, of interest to you guys is that right now we have a disparate impact case about response times to 911 calls throughout the city of Chicago. And we're also representing um, someone who uh, had a parody account of the mayor of Peoria on Twitter. And the mayor um, responded not with, with words, but by um, getting warrants and searching his house and arresting him. So that's a, a pending um, lawsuit in the Central District of Illinois. So but what I want to focus on tonight is kind of the way that we use three areas of advocacy to, to add, the three areas of advocacy where we use a lot of data. We do it in policy reform, we do it um, in our lobbying efforts, and we also do it through litigation. Um, the first example I want to give is the Illinois Traffic Stop Statistical Study Act, which creates an entire database of all the traffic stops that occur across the state of Illinois by every, um, by, by the Illinois State Police, by every municipality, and it records the stops by, by race of the driver and also collects information about whether the driver um, was asked to give permission to have their car searched during the course of the stop. There's other data collected as well about dog sniffs and, um, and, and kind of the, the content of what happened in the stop and whether it resulted in the ticket, and et cetera. Um, we've, we've used this data to, to generate a number of reports that are available on our website. And the conclusion of those reports is that there is a, a disparity in the way that, um, that law enforcement uh, uses traffic stops throughout Illinois. I'm, I'm focusing on one of the reports here in Chicago. We can have data for Chicago. Um, African Americans were disproportionately stopped uh, compared to the rate of their pop population, and that um, is exacerbated in predominantly white neighborhoods. This is a theme that you're going to hear throughout the, the evening. And then um, the, the thing that is really kind of disturbing is that, you know, the hit rate is the magic number that you look at a lot of times in, in police misconduct cases. And the question is, is you know, when, they're, when they think that when a police officer thinks that there's something in their, their car, how often are they right? And in Chicago, they're right with white people a lot more often than they're right with people of color. So that tells us that, um, that the level of suspicion that they're using before they go into somebody's car, um, it's, it's not turning out accurate results um, you know, when, they're, when they're going through it. So this is one example where we ad advocated for a law. We were, um, we were major lobbyists on I'm trying to get this law through the, the General Assembly in, in Illinois. Um, the sponsor for the law was pre then um, now President Obama, and it was um, picked up by, by a number of, of key representatives and, and pushed through. And now we have this database of information that everybody can use to try to analyze it. And, um, and really the goal is for police, smaller police departments and larger, well, all the police departments to correct action when they, when they see that they have disparities. And that's happened over the course of um, the, the over 10 years this act has been in effect, which is, which is a good thing. Um, the second piece that I'd like to talk about is how um, we use and collaborate with our national office, because we're an affiliate, we have affiliates throughout the country, um, to work on projects as well. And this is, um, this is a report that's available on our national website and on our website about the impact of the, marijuana, the war on marijuana on people of color. And the, the thing that I think is interesting about this is that almost everything that they used in this report is public data that was already available. It was um, data collected by the FBI on arrest rates, and um, they, they didn't really have to do much FOIA to, to get to this information. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act, for people who aren't familiar. And what this found is that um, despite the fact that African Americans and white people use drugs, um, particularly marijuana, at, at roughly the same rate, um, 
young, young white men use it a little bit more. Um, the, their arrest rates for African Americans is, uh, six, is just much, much higher. In Illinois, um, it, uh, black people were 7.56 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession in 2010. And this is, we've used this report and the, the data in it to, um, to lobby for change in Springfield. We used it when we were lobbying for the Medical Marijuana Act. We've used it when, we've been lob when we lobby for um, decriminalization and for, for changes in, um, in the, the criminal code. And then the last example is kind of um, a, a combination of, of all the different sources of data that, that we've, and all the ways that we try to get it. And that's a recent report that we've done on, on stop and frisk. So stop and frisk is when a police officer, it's supposed to be when a police officer has reasonable suspicion that you've committed, that you've just committed or you're about to commit a crime. And you're only supposed to be frisked if uh, that there's reasonable suspicion that you're, uh, you're going to create a danger to the officer because you have a weapon. In the practical reality, that's not the way it plays out on the streets of Chicago or really anywhere in the country. And um, we're, we're concerned that, like in New York, which got a lot of attention, um, the stop and frisk practice in Chicago has is, is become very abusive. So um, we had a lawsuit. We've, we've been working on this issue for, for decades. There were um, cases in the 60s and 70s on this as well out of our office, but the, the most recent one was a 2003 case where we represented uh, a Shawnee Davis, who's an Olympic speed skater. He was stopped a couple of blocks from his mother's house in Rogers Park, um, a really pretty aggressive, bad stop. And we also represented a few other um, Chicago citizens, a CTA bus driver, a few other people. And uh, this case ended up being settled. And as part of the settlement, um, one of the requirements was that the city had to start collecting more data about, um, about stops. And we're always looking for that. We're always looking for more data. Collecting more data means that you're shining a light on practices that are otherwise hidden. And it's particularly important to stop and frisk because it's the closest you get to an arrest without arresting somebody. And it's never reviewed by a judge um, unless you, and, and you're subsequently arrest, arrested. Just to stop and frisk, you know, no one's going to look at it unless a police supervisor reviews it, unless, um, you know, unless we review it because we FOIA it. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, the interaction happens and there's no public disclosure. So this was a really important step that the city started collecting um, some data about these stops. And part of the requirement is that they had to um, write down the reasons for the contact, which is supposed to be based on reasonable suspicion. So, um, we, we did a FOIA request um, based on the fact that we know that it's now collected for the, um, for the, the number of stops that occurred between um, May and August of 2014. And this is what we found out, that there is a tremendously high number of stops that are occurring in Chicago. If we compare it to the number in New York, we're, we're roughly four times the number of stops is at the height of the stop and frisk practice there. Um, you, you guys may be interested, if some of you may know Elliot Ramos, he um, was involved, I, yeah, he did a great report um, <coughs> at WBEZ on this issue uh, a couple of years before we did this report, looking at similar data. But this really, this really shocked us that, that we're at, at this level of, uh, in terms of the number of stops. <coughs> and the, the thing about this that's um, really shocking is that this is the number of people who are stopped that are completely innocent. They're not arrested, they don't get a ticket. Um, it's, it's people who are stopped and then let go. We then also did a FOIA request for 300 of the stops that um, occurred in a slightly earlier time period for reasons I can explain later if anybody's interested. And then we did a, re a, a legal analysis of each of the reasons and made a determination of whether or not um, there was reasonable suspicion. And we found that in half of the cards that we reviewed, there wasn't reasonable suspicion of criminal activity for um, for the stop, and you know there was either not enough information. You have to cite facts, for reasonable suspicion, and there was either not enough information for a supervisor to tell whether the stop was good, or the reasons <coughs> given just weren't good at all. For example, there's a guy here who was detained for pickpocketing on a previous occasion, and that has nothing to do with what he'd just done. So um, it's it's very concerning. 
The other thing that we learned is that this is impacting the African American community disproportionately. Um, African Americans make up about 32% of the population in Chicago, but they are um, they're stopped 72% uh, of the time. Um, this is both a function of the fact that there are a lot more stops in predominantly not African American um, communities. There's about 96 stops per 1,000 people overall in Chicago, but we're pushing over 450 in Harrison, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, but then when we also looked at predominantly white neighborhoods, African Americans are still being stopped disproportionate to their population in those neighborhoods. So um, I, I live in, uh, I live, am I on there? I'm not on there. All right, well, but if you look at Jefferson Park, it's, um, it's uh, you know, African Americans make up 1% of the population, but 15% of, of the stops. And that, that gives us some concerns about, about whether um, it, there's a, uh, a disparate impact. So as part of the report, we're now lobbying for more data. <laughs> um, our, our number one policy recommendation is that we need to improve data collection. And um, the, what we need and what we're recommending is to put Chicago back in step with other cities around the country. And New York and Philadelphia and LA and, um, and countries and cities across the country, um, uh, the police departments are collecting information about all of the stops, and that includes the, um, the stops that lead to an arrest as well. Here in um, Chicago, we don't know that. In, in New York, for example, one of the driving forces of the litigation that happened there was that um, there were 88% of the people who were stopped were, were innocent and only 12% were either arrested or received a summons. And in Chicago, we don't know that information. In, Chicago, in New York, one of the pieces that they looked at was how many stops led to a frisk. And in Chicago, we don't collect information about frisks at all. And one of the reasons that's really worrisome is that if a frisk occurs, it's on the street, the person isn't arrested, the likelihood of that ever being, it's next to zero that a court's ever going to look at it. So people are having their bodies searched on the street with, with no record. And because we're not making any records of frisks, the, um, we don't know how often they uncover weapons. One of the main justifications for stop and frisk that they put forward in New York is, is we're, getting, we're getting weapons off the street, this is a social good, but when they looked at the data, they only found a weapon in about 2% of, um, it was actually under 2% of the, the frisks that occurred. In Chicago, we, we just don't have that data. So um, we're, we're in the process of, you know, we've published this report, we're encouraging the city to collect this data, make it public, um, have police officers issue receipts when they do a stop and frisk, because one of the concerns we have is we've had complaints about stops, and then we do a FOIA request to get the, the contact card, and there's no card. Um, and then we think that it, this really, the, the information that we've collected really calls out for additional training of police officers. Um, when we did the FOIA request to find out all of this information, we also learned that they haven't done updated training on, on stop and frisk policies. Um, they, they weren't able to identify a single person who'd gotten updated training since they left the academy since 10, 2010. So um, it, we're really, we're very much concerned about that. Um, and, and in addition to the policy work that we do, I mentioned before we have a legal arm, so um, we, we also engage in advocacy through litigation. And I, having said that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that people have or stay after and, and chat with anyone if, if I'm running over time. Yes? Karen, could you also tell us what you're doing with respect to license plate reader? Yes, so um, automated license plate ALPRs, automated license plate readers, are devices that, um, when there are a couple ways they can do it. But one of them is that they can attach it to a police car, drive down the street, collect every license plate that's parked or that's seen around the seat, street, collect the GPS data for that license plate, take a picture of the license plate, and keep it in a database. And currently in Illinois, there are no restraints on on police departments doing that. Um, there are no restraints on what happens to the data once um, it's collected. And we have concerns that it's going to be... 
<laughs> we have concerns that it's just basically really available for data mining in a way that invades people's privacies. Like you could find out like who's been, um, you know, in, in front of the abortion clinic or at the political rally, or uh, you, know, you can think of the parade of horribles. So we've, in addition to asking the government to collect a lot of data, we also sometimes ask them to be restrained in their use of data, and that's one of the instances. So we, we currently have a bill in, um, in the General Assembly that would pr uh, create some, some guidelines and structures around the use of the data. I, I don't know what it, the current status of the bill is in terms of, of how it reads, but you can look for updates on our website about that. Yes? Uh, so when you collect the data, so when you collect the data, and um, do you like the recommendations based off that? Like, do you recommend that police would target or make arrests like based on population sample, or actually make arrests on through the data instead of committing more crimes? Like, since you have more like white like, people, do you recommend like targeting white people? We, we, no. <laughs> well, I mean, like with marijuana, we think we shouldn't be targeting anybody, but you know, like it, probably the, the numbers would even out if you went to a couple frat houses. So, um, <laughs> I, I, the, really, this is more a benchmark. It's more a, um, a something that should trigger investigation. It, what we think should be happening is that there should be a lot of data collected and that supervisors and people within the police department should be watching their own to make sure that people aren't acting out of proportion to reality. Like if there's a police officer who only pulls over black, black people all the time, they never result in contraband when they do it, that's a flag that you may want to bring the person in for additional training. Um, I, so it, really this is more about the, the Fourth Amendment piece of it though, where, where we looked at the only half of them are good, that's something that just needs to be fixed through training. Um, in terms of the racial disparities, it, it's 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 a flag to tell you that um, there may be there may be an illness in the the body politic that we need to try to correct. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the records that you were able to receive through the FOIA request, uh, is there information about which police officers you know have disproportionate rates? Because I mean, I I think I I don't know how you know what is uh, appropriate for reporting that, but. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, as a benchmark, like, this tells us that there's something about policing in Chicago has gone bad, but, you know, it gets like, maybe more actionable if you can report it down to, like, the officer level to say, like, hey, you you, yeah. you are flagged for training or yeah. for a sanction or a review or, you know, whatever. But we have information <clears throat> down to the level of police officer to beat level to district level all the way up, um, really for public reporting. Um, the, the broad strokes are easier for people to digest a lot of times. That's what we stuck with. Yes? That's a question. Okay, where did you get information from? I guess the data from and, and the integrity of the data. That's what I'm going to ask to you know, understand what's really happening if you can ask the data or not. Yeah. So um, we, we get the data. We got this data, the stop and frisk data, through a Freedom of Information ask, a re Act request to the Chicago Police Department. So we are dealing with the city's data. It's not independently verified in any way. And we do have concerns that there's underreporting of the number of stops that occur because we, we get complaints and then we can't find the contact card. So it's, um, again, it's, it's imperfect, but we, this is their data, this is how they present it, and I think it still tells a really dark tale when you look at it. Yes? My question is also about um, so you mentioned that you're trying to encourage Chicago to drive down closer to the north and other cities. Uh, we're encouraging them to what? Chicago to drive their, um, their, like, I think it was the first, the stops down to a reasonable level that other cities have, like in New York. Because in New York, people are also having problems with level that they're at. So I'm wondering what the meaning of using those metrics to encourage people to drive And if there's some defense for those metrics, or whether there's like a better approach altogether that you guys can support it. That's interesting. So, I, you know, when I when I mentioned New York and Philadelphia and, and other cities, they're, they're collecting more data is the piece that we want to encourage Chicago to do. I think that um, the, the reason that we show the disparity between Chicago and New York is that I think that there's not an awareness of how much is happening in Chicago. Um, the New York got a ton of press. It got a ton of national press. I think, I, how many people had heard about the New York stop and frisk suit? It was 
it was national news. And I think that what we're trying to do is wake up people to the fact that it's not just New York where this is happening. Um, in terms of the metrics, how many stops should occur, um, well, the, the, the half stops that we looked at that didn't have reasonable suspicion on the car, you know, maybe some of them there was reasonable suspicion and the officer needed to write more information, but they're ordered to write all the information. So those half should, <laughs> they shouldn't be happening if they violate the Fourth Amendment. Yes. So with the stop and frisk policy in New York City, like that was very much a policy that was, you know, driven by a mayor, right, that said, you know, like this is the law now, this is what we're going to do. So what, was there some sort of directive to Chicago police, like to make all these stops and then not have any data? Like where is that directive coming from? Um, we, we do think that we wouldn't see this number of stops if it wasn't encouraged by, by the top. And we, we know that Superintendent McCarthy has, um, he, was, he was in New York, he was in New York, they have strong stop and frisk and they encourage stop and frisk policies in both of those cities. Newark had a, Dep a Department of Justice investigation against it for their use of stop and frisk. So we're concerned that that's part of the source of it. Yes. Yeah. The, um, the data on the stop and frisk is linked to actually the economic um, output that's required for it. I mean, everything they do with stop and frisk it must cost police officer time. Right. It also costs them a million time. And then I'm sure that we, there ends up being lawsuit time. <laughs> No, go for it. <laughs> That'd be great. I mean, I, I think that we, we definitely see losses in the same districts that the high, have the highest number of stop and frisks. They have the longest waits for 911 calls. So the energy is being put into the stop and frisk practice instead of responding to crimes that are in action, and that's that's a concern. Yes. Um. Can you say something about um, transparency for private police forces? I'm thinking in particular, since I'm a University of Chicago student, about the UCPD, which controls a lot of the South Side that doesn't have the same um, uh, public reporting requirements. Has the ACLU been involved with that at all? I know there's a lot happening right now. Yeah, that's a great that's a great issue to bring up. That you know, because I think that we're all becoming more aware of how all police forces, including private ones. Um, have have been um, been abusive in the last couple of years, and it's it's been a concern. The good news, and I'm getting this from reporting, not from personal knowledge, is that the University of Chicago has agreed to collect all the data about their stops and make it public. I believe it was Craig Futterman at the the clinic at U of C that that drove that, and um, that's that's really good news. So, uh, it, as far as I know right now, I haven't reviewed their actual policy. They're doing what we're asking the city to do. Seven o'clock. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to stay in chat. We know we have more questions. <laughs>